We are in 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you would turn there please with me this morning. We have been talking about the do's and don'ts. He's been talking about elders, he's been talking about deacons, he's been talking about those who are uh, worthy of double honor, he's talking about uh, the qualifications of those uh, positions in a church. Basically, it needs to be somebody that is above reproach in, in all ways possible. And now we're talking this morning about just kind of church life in general, how Christians are supposed to conduct themselves. I honestly think that sometimes as Christians, we forget that it's being a Christian is more than just saying that we're a Christian. It's a lot more. It's a code of ethics, if you will. It's a a way to live. It's a, a change that's taken place in our life. Now, let me say this. Please, please hear me now. Religion is trying to make those changes without God. That's just religion. Where you just abide by a bunch of rules, but you don't feel it. You don't have it. You don't think it. It's just not in your heart. So you're jumping through the hoops, but you're missing them all the time because it's just not there. It's trying to pretend to be in love. If it's not there, it's not there. But when you are born again, when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, now you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You now have the power and the strength to live by those code of ethics because it's written on your heart. Not just in a bunch of commandments, but it's written on your heart. If you see a husband and wife that love each other, there's evidences of that. There's kindnesses towards one another. There's a servant heart attitude towards each other. So he's going to give us some of these do's and don'ts of church life. And you've probably even caught yourself at some point in time either having an attitude with somebody on the freeway or somebody who's trying to serve you food and taking an hour and a half to serve it. You've you've probably felt yourself have that feeling, that attitude, and all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm, not supposed to, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm not supposed to act this way. I'm not supposed to be this way. So this is another loving reminder from the Apostle Paul telling young Timothy as a pastor of a new church, telling him what he needs to do. Now, if you remember right, in the last teaching, he told Timothy about this, or we studied about the great falling away or the apostasy, if you will. There will be those that are lying spirits or false teachers that will come into the church and that will invade the church. Now, I believe it's a lot the same way with our country. There are those who would like to take away our freedom. Now, I'm not going to name people. I'm not going to name certain groups, although I'm not afraid to. But my point is this. For us to innocently think that we can not defend ourselves and that the enemy won't make advances is foolishness. It's the same with our spiritual life. For us to think that if we don't put the guard up, that if we don't study, if we don't learn, if we don't grow, if we don't pray, there is going to be that which enters the church that's going to be contrary to what the Word of God teaches. And I believe it's already here, and I believe it's already here in Mass. Because if you ever go to a church and they say something that's off the wall, you need to see if you can find it in the scriptures. You need to see if it's, if it's there. And if it's not there, um, you, you need to really, really maybe go one-on-one and talk to whoever and see if there's a clarification that can be made in that particular instance and circumstance. And if it continues and you, you just don't feel good about it, then maybe it's not your home. You know, maybe, maybe it's just not the place where God wants you to be. Okay, he told Christians to avoid old wives' tales. And basically that just means arguing over things that don't matter. There's a lot of people arguing over a lot of things that don't matter, and they've been doing it for a long, long time, and I seriously doubt it will ever stop. But for Christians, we need to be careful of that. We need to try to not get into arguments or discussions about things that really are irrelevant. And I look at the scriptures this way. There is so much in here that I can talk about that I don't need to worry about the stuff that's going to hurt another brother or another sister. 
That's what, I'm, that's what I'm, I'm trying to mean. Now, I'm not talking about compromising the truth. I'm just talking about arguing over something that just doesn't matter. And the illustration has been used, how many angels can sit on the head of a pen, right? Who knows? Who knows if they even want to sit on the head of a pen? Or that God would ever require them to sit on the head of a pen? But that's the kind of useless nonsense that I'm talking about. We would be better off, instead of arguing with everyone, we would be just better off loving the Lord. We'd be better off praying or even praying for them. So, we are to be an example. Christians are to be an example. He told Timothy to use the gifts that he had within him. And I believe that every single born-again believer has gifts. They may have one, they may have many, but they have gifts that have been given to them when the Holy Spirit began to reside in their life and in their heart. And I believe we should use those. You might think, well, what can I do? You'd be amazed at what you can do. Just a little kindness, giving somebody a hug, giving somebody a handshake, just maybe digging in and getting a dollar to give somebody or buying them a a sack of groceries or just about anything. But we should all be using those gifts that God has given to us. And he told Timothy to continue in the things of the Lord, the things that he knew that were right and the things that he knew were true. Pastor Chuck told all of us young pastors when we were young, He told us all, he said, you know, when you get to a place in scripture where you're not sure, I mean, it's it's maybe not clear to you and you don't quite understand it. He always told us, fall back on what you do know. And I found that to be immensely beneficial. Well, what do I know? I know that God loves me. No matter how I feel. I may not feel like he loves me. I may not feel like he even cares about me, but I know that he loves me because this tells me so. You guys remember, you know, you learned that song in vacation Bible school or somewhere along the line. Jesus loves me, this I know, why? Because the Bible tells me so. You know that, right? I know that God loves me. Second of all, I know that God doesn't make mistakes. No matter what I think, no matter whether I think he's made a mistake or whether he didn't ask me for counseling, you know, whenever he did whatever he did in my life, he doesn't make mistakes, He's righteous. He's holy. So I found that when I'm in a situation where maybe I'm a bit confused or I'm hurting, I found those to be of tremendous help in my life to remind myself that my God loves me, that he's a good God. He's not a vengeful God. He doesn't look around for somebody who's having a little fun and going, oh, I'm going to mess up their life a little bit because they're having a little bit too much fun. That's not the kind of God that we have. So now Paul's turning to the practical do's and don'ts of church life. If you would pray with me, we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for our life in you. I thank you for these dear folks, Lord, that show up, that take the time to to come in and we gather around your word and have a, hopefully, a good spiritual meal together. Break bread together, the real bread that means life, the bread of life. And Lord, I just pray for each single one here that you would bless them. And Father, if there's barriers or walls between them and you, that they'd let them go. Because in reality, it doesn't matter what, what we think. It matters what you think. And turning our hearts and turning our minds around to what you feel is right can either take a lifetime Or it could be done in an instant. But many times, Lord, our pride just gets in the way and we just can't let it go. We want something. We want what we want regardless of what you say. As a result of that, most of the time we end up miserable. So, Father, may you speak to us this morning. May you teach us. May you reach us. May you heal us. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. It says, do not rebuke an older man. I didn't write this, just so you know. It's not, they're not talking about me, although I am an older man. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity okay so there's really four classifications if you will older and younger men older and younger women 
And each of them is to be treated a little differently, but yet treated with honor and treated with respect. The older men in any fellowship, they're to be treated like you would a father, your dad. Hopefully, you wouldn't just rip into your dad. Even if dad was wrong, hopefully there's a little bit of love, hopefully there's a little bit of respect, and hopefully you approach it with a little kindness and with a little love that goes a long way in that particular setting. So if you find yourself in the church and you need to talk to to someone who's a little bit older than you, they could just be a few years older than you. Do it with honor and do it with with respect. But I have to say this. I want to say this. Even with the younger, show them some respect. You know, there should be the same honor and love and respect even that way also. So we're not supposed to be... We're not supposed to verbally chastise. Those kind of things need to be done in private. They need to be, do, to be, to be done one-on-one like Matthew 18 says. If you have something against a brother, you go to them and you talk to them privately. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Not put it on Facebook. And unfortunately, and a lot of times today, it gets put on Facebook or gets put somewhere else. Instead of just going to them one-on-one, doing your best to try to explain, guys, we don't always have to agree. Again, I need to say that. We don't always have to agree on absolutely everything. If you took some of the best marriages from any church and you asked them if they agreed on everything, they would say no. They would say no. We don't agree on everything. You don't have to agree on everything to have a happy, successful marriage. Nor do you have to agree with absolutely everything to have a happy and successful Christian walk and have a happy and successful church. Okay, so Scripture says to do that privately. And then if that doesn't work out, maybe you take someone with you and you try to talk to that person. But you need to make sure that they are in error. Before you do that, not just your own opinion against somebody else's opinion, but that they're truly in error. Okay, the younger men, they're to be treated as brothers. You know, if you have a little brother or a little sister, once you get out of the biting, scratching, hitting stage with your siblings, you, you, you have love for them, don't you? I mean, don't you? You're going, no, I got one, I can't stand. But that's not what I mean, I'm talking about the other ones. You have a little love, you have a little respect, you have a little honor that you have there. And if you have a little brother or a little sister and you need to talk to them about something, you really want to do it in the right way, don't you? Don't, don't you want what you have to say to be accepted to where they know that you absolutely love them, that you're not trying to hurt them? It's supposed to be the same way with us. We have a, a young brother or a young sister in the Lord that's doing something that maybe we don't like or we think it's a little odd or a little different. Even if we go to them, first of all, I would say this, pray, 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 pray before you ever go because God will give you a heart to be able to approach that person or he'll tell you, leave them alone. You know, they're young. They're going to grow. They're gonna, this is going to work itself out. But if you do, you go to them, like I said, as a little brother or a little sister in the Lord with the utmost, again, of love. Now, it says older women in the church to be treated as you would your mom. So if there's an older lady in the church, you treat her like you would your mother with, again, the ultimate of love and respect. Now, I want you to think about this. Just the things I've mentioned so far, if we approach things that way, how much better would life be? And let's take it outside the church. Remember, Christians shouldn't be just Christians inside the church. It should be outside the church. And the same kind of honor, the same kind of respect. I'm old-fashioned, but I think holding the door open for a lady is a right thing to do. And if they get mad at you for doing it, you still did a good thing, right? Don't let society, don't let what's politically correct change what the Word of God says. Okay. Now we're going to be dealing with the younger women. They're to be treated as sisters With all purity, with sinlessness, sinlessness. It's not uncommon at all to be sitting in a restaurant somewhere and some young lady walks in who's beautiful. And every man in the place is like, right? Drawn to to her. 
Watching how she walks, watching how she looks, watch how she sits down, watching everything that the gal does. That's got to be extremely uncomfortable for, for you gals. But my point is this. There's a difference between looking at someone and saying, man, she's beautiful. Wouldn't you say that to your sister? If your sister was beautiful, wouldn't you tell her she's beautiful? There's a big difference between appreciating someone's beauty, appreciating someone's character, appreciating who they are, without taking it any further than that. And guys, you know what I'm talking about. For young dating people, there are certain things you wouldn't even think about doing with your sister that you may be thinking about doing with the person that you're dating, but that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that you treat her with all honor and respect and with all purity. You're not supposed to touch her inappropriately. You're not supposed to speak to her seductively. Now, put these in line with your sister. You'd be pretty gross, wouldn't you? I mean, this would be pretty gross, or either that or you're, you have an illness that you need to go see a doctor about. So, whether we think that we're in love or not, until marriage, the opposite sex is to be treated as a brother or a sister. And I can't think of a quicker way than to really mess up your chances of making it than to begin making it before you make it. (laughs) If you know what I mean. I can't think of a quicker way to mess up a relationship, to destroy a relationship without even getting to know who the other person is. You don't even know who they are. You don't know what their personality is. Guys, there's a thing in our society called fake it till you make it. I've seen so many people fake it to get the other person. I've seen people pretend to be Christians, to act like Christians because the other one is a Christian and they won't marry them or go out with them unless they are a Christian. So they say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I went to church in 73. I'm a Christian. Please, please, please. This is, this is advice that's given so that we can think with our head and not other parts of the body. So you can de- try to decide who this person is and whether or not you want to spend the rest of your life with them. Many, many times, people who get involved sexually before they get married, they end up getting caught up in that and they don't really even know who the other person is. And they realize a year later they don't like them at all. They don't like the personality. They don't like the way they act. They don't like the way they they do things. It's been said, ladies, if you want to find a good man, find one and watch how he treats his mom. I believe there's a lot of truth to that. If there's a, a love, if there's a respect, if there's an honor, he's probably learned that from a young age if he's still got it and he's still respecting his mom. The idea is that that will carry on in to you also. That there will be love, there will be respect, and there will be honor. And guys, it works the other way too. Watch. Watch how they treat other people outside of church. Not just in church, but outside of church. When the pressure is on, when the stress is on, when the food is 45 minutes late, when someone cuts them off on the freeway, and I know we're all going... Oh boy, this is getting hot in here, you know, because we've we've all done dumb things. But, but again, watch them for a while. This is good advice. Do people listen to it? No. Excuse me. People don't listen to it. But can you imagine how much better life would be if we did? How many fewer babies there would be? Yeah, I don't mean that in a bad way. I've never understood where, you know, you've got people who want babies and people who don't want them, but the ones who want them can't have them. You know, I've I've never, I've never quite understood that. Okay, now we're going to move on to another group in the church, and that are that are the widows. That is the widows, and and Paul's going to make a distinction of what a real widow is and what a not so real widow is in the church, and how to define that and how to clarify that. Verse 3, honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show 
uh, piety. Now, that word piety means fidelity, uh, fidelity to natural obligations, like you would show an obligation to your parents. So it says, let them first show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before the Lord. So a widow with children and grandchildren, they should be supported by her family. Now, I know that for many of us, we're going, gosh, I can barely get by myself. It's your mom. It's your dad. We've got to take care of them to the best of our ability. Does that mean you've got to move them into the house and let them sleep on your pillow? No. You know, that's, that's not what I'm saying. Sometimes them living with you is the absolute best thing that can be done. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can't provide the care that they really need. Sometimes you can't provide the physical therapy or whatever that needs to be done. Sometimes we're just not equipped or qualified to be able to take care of them. But when the family calls up and said, hey, mom's going to need to have some, some care You don't go, hey, you know, everybody else is chipping in, but not me. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give anything. I'm not going to be involved. That's not right, guys. You may not be able to give as much as one of the guys who makes 150,000 a year, but you can give something. You can do something. Maybe help take them to the doctor, maybe um, be a taxi, whatever is necessary to be done. But again, Paul saying that it is good and it is acceptable to the Lord that these children and grandchildren repay the kindness and the care that this mother or grandmother has shown them and given them. Now he gives a little more definition. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, that means she has no one. She trusts in God continues in the supplications and prayers day and night. She's committed. She's a committed Christian. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. Notice how the godly widow spends her time. It's not just to satisfy herself, not just to satisfy her flesh, but she spends it doing what she can to serve the Lord. Stepping up, being involved. And you know what? There's a lot of godly women who have done that through the years. And a lot of godly men who have lost their spouse and they say, you know what? I can, I can serve. I'm going to be involved. I was talking to the pastor out at Surprise. I taught out there for a couple times for him. And he lives right there by the edge of Sun City. And they have a unique setting. Because when, uh, when it gets really, really hot, um, the, the older folks move. Right? They, they all go. They, they go to where it's cooler. Because they have houses and stuff where it's cooler. When it's cold and it's snowing, they come out here where it's warm. But it's kind of cool because he said that the young and the old, those two things work hand in hand because when the older come in, they start babysitting, they start watching kids, they start working in the nursery to help the, the younger, and then the younger take care of them when they need to take care of them when they're, they're there. And I, and I thought, man, what a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. You know, instead of generations going, oh, we have nothing in common, they're loving each other and serving each other. Okay, let's go on. Evidently, there were some that felt this new freedom, being a widow, was an opportunity for them to get back in the world. So, maybe they went back into dating, maybe they went back into whatever it was but it wasn't in a godly setting or it wouldn't be mentioned here by the Apostle Paul. And he wanted Timothy to know that there's a difference between these situations. And because there's a difference in these two situations, he's telling Timothy, you've got to understand the church has to handle those two settings differently. 
One is a true widow. One really needs help. But the other one is spending whatever they have on pleasure. And he's basically saying that that widow is not a financial concern of the church at all. Because they're not doing anything to try to serve the Lord in any way. And I don't mean just plugging into a church and become a deacon. I mean just loving the Lord. That's all. Loving the Lord. Being involved in the things of God. But they are to be taken care of by their families. And uh, the other ones are to be taken care of by the church. Now here, let me, let me say this guys. You don't hear Pastor Dan and I talk about money very much. Because when we're in scriptures, if we get to money, we teach about it. If we're not, you know, talking about money, we, if, if it's not there, we usually don't teach on it. We trust that God will provide. I believe that as believers, we should be giving. And if you don't believe in your church, not the, it, maybe you're visiting and you go to another church. So let's take us out of the equation. If you go to another church and you don't believe in your church enough to support them and help them, you should find a church that you do. You should find one that you go and you get a, you get a spiritual meal, you feel fed, you feel good, you feel good about it, you love the people there. Because I believe that as God's kids, we're supposed to keep the warehouse full. And I'll go back to Joseph when there was a famine in Egypt. You guys might remember he became second in command to the Pharaoh because he gave the Pharaoh some advice. He said, there's a famine coming. And he says, if you don't prepare for it, all of your people, most of Egypt's going to starve to death. So he said, now, while it's good, while it's prosperous, you take the grain and you begin to store it. And you put it in the warehouses. So when the famine comes, the people will still have something to eat. So I believe that's our model. We're supposed to have the, the warehouse full. Now I don't, I'm not talking about billions of dollars. I'm just talking about what we can do as a church. You have the warehouse full. So that when we have a true widow, we can help her. When there is a, a true need. When there's something that's going on in someone's life that's beyond their control. And there's nothing that they can do, but they love the Lord, that we can help. And unfortunately, for quite some time, we haven't been able to do that. And I'll leave that there, but I just want to make the the point that this should be a concern of the church. We should be able to be able to take care of that widow. Maybe not be her full support but to at least contribute, at least to be able to help in some way because of our love for her. Okay, look at uh, verses 9 through 9 and 10. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she's been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the feet, feet of the saints, And if she has relieved the afflicted, and if she has diligently followed every good work. So, he's kind of giving a list. Okay, when you're trying to sort this out and find out who a true widow is and who is not, and the ones that you should support, you need to look at the godly character. That's what he's saying. You need to look at the godly character. You need to see if she's tried her best to live in an honorable way in the Lord. Now, he's not saying, don't help someone like that, but what he's saying is that the funds should first go to those who have been faithful. That's what he's saying. Now, if there's a surplus, and the warehouse is full, and someone comes in who, who maybe hasn't, maybe, you, maybe the Lord lays on your heart to minister to them as a witness. So, so what I'm trying to say is Paul's not saying you can't give if someone doesn't meet every single qualification. But he's saying, here's some guidelines for you to know who is a true widow and who is not a true widow. And those that are true widows will have done these things. You follow me so far? Okay. Look at verse 11. But refuse the younger widows. For when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, he, when he says younger, he already gave a 60 uh, limit, didn't he? The younger widows, because when they began to grow wanton, um, they, began to grow, they begin to grow wanton against Christ. They desire 
to Mary, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. Not their, not their husband, but they've cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle. Remember, we're talking about widows here. They learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. You don't have to be 60 to be a, a gossip or a busybody. Right? You don't have to be female to be a busybody. You can be male. I mean, there's some guys who, they couldn't keep a secret if you wrapped it in a thousand dollar bill. <laughs> so so it's, not, it's, not a, it, it's not a gender thing. It, it's an issue of having too much idle time. You guys remember what it was like first day of vacation from school? It's like, yes. What was it like about the third month? I don't know if it was the same for you as it was for me, but by that third month, I'm going, man. You know, after Little League's done or baseball or Sandlot ball or whatever it is that you do during the summer, after your programs, after everything else is done, you're like, man. And maybe you weren't this way, and I hate to admit it, but it's like, man, I want to go back to school. I, I want to see my friends. I, I want to hang out with people. I, need, I want that social interaction again. We do not do well with idle hands. We, we just do not do well. People, I hear them all the time talking about, man, can't wait to retire. Ace, I'm not picking on you wherever you're at. <laughs> it's like, I can't wait to retire. And and retirement can be a wonderful thing or it can be a horrible thing. I love my father-in-law to pieces. He went, he's already gone home to be with the Lord. He could not wait. He was in the automotive service industry for years and years. And it was very taxing on him. And he couldn't wait to retire. And when he retired, he sat in front of the TV and watched TV all day long. It wasn't good for him. It wasn't good for him at all. And we, we always say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, don't, don't. Don't be so sure. You ever miss church on a Sunday and the next Sunday you're going, "Ah." right? Or Wednesday night, you quit going on one Wednesday night, two, three, four, five, four, pretty soon you're never around, right? That's our nature. Our nature is that way. So, busybodies, too much time. Guys, I used to tell my kids, my sons, I would tell them the only thing that's worse than a job is no job. I mean, people say, and you hear this all the time, follow your dreams. Find something that you love to do, and it'll all work out. How many of you have jobs that is not your dream? Come on, be honest. It's not your dream. You'd rather have a different job. But you do it because it's necessary. Some things in life you just need to do because it's necessary. And we were made in such a way that we need something to do. Why do you think that God had Adam name all the animals? He was sitting in front of the TV too much. No, but I mean, think about it. He could have named them all, right? Just boom. He could have named them all at one time and said, you know, you study this and you'll be fine. He said, you name them. Why do you think he made Eve? He goes, you know, Adam's all alone. It's not good for him to be alone. Give him somebody to talk to. He doesn't need to be alone. It's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for us. It, it feels good to our flesh. Yes, it does feel good to our flesh. It's nice not to have to punch a clock. It's nice not to have to get up. It's nice not to have to do any of those things. But I promise you, it will grow very, very old. The need to belong. The need to make it count. The need to do something for other people. It needs to be there in our life. So my encouragement is, let's all go to work. You know? Let's be productive. It's a good thing to do. 14, verse 14. Therefore I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, Give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. Now, I would say this to male or female. Not the bearing children part. (laughs) 
But he's basically saying, make your life count. Be involved. Don't just disengage from life and, and let it all pass by you. But be actively involved. Because I am sure that when we disengage, we age a lot. We need that. Now that word wanton means to feel sexual desire. In other words, it's much likely for a younger widow to become lonely, desire to remarry, where he's saying that the older widows, um, they found it much easier to dedicate themselves to a life of celibacy and a, a life of prayer. That's just, that's just reality. And that's what he's putting out there in front of us. There was another problem for some of the young widows. Again, that was the idle part. They weren't productive in any way. Instead of being productive, they were being destructive. And you know, I found this. Sometimes the people who complain the most are the ones who are doing the least. Because when you're busy, you don't have time for that stuff. right? Ain't nobody got time for that. You don't. You really don't. You don't have time for that. You're busy. You go home at, uh, from work at night. You're, you're tired. It, it, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna argue about how many angels sit on the head of a pen. You figure it out. I'm tired. You just don't have the time. So when you're working, you're serving the Lord, you're busy. There's no time for all of that stuff. So we need as Christians to not be destructive. Don't be destructive. Don't be destructive in your kid's life. Don't be destructive in your, in your spouse's life. Don't be destructive in, in any way. But as a Christian, we need to be productive. We need to be doing something good with our life. And it's so easy to be destructive. Now, I, I like technology. So when I mention these guys, be careful with your phone, be careful with your email, be careful with your chat rooms, be careful with Facebook, be careful with Instagram, and the list goes on and on because we got, a, we got dozens of ways now to gossip and be unproductive. And I don't know about you, you get on Facebook, you can't get off. So don't go there. No, I'm just kidding. If you've got to go there, that's a different thing. But you rarely find much of anything that's productive on it. And you get tired of seeing cats. Or what people are eating for lunch. Nobody cares anymore. That's kind of slowing down a little bit. But just be careful. Should you not use any of those? No, I'm not saying that. Just be moderate. Just, just be careful. Just be careful what you say and what you do. Remember, if you put something in writing, it is there. You can't take it back. And someday it will come back. Somebody will find it and somebody will bring it back. Just look at the fit that everybody's thrown over the new president. I mean, they, they're digging through trash. They're digging through everything. Everything is the Russians' fault. And, you know, they're trying to find anything they can possibly find. So I'm just saying, be careful. And I, and I believe this is good advice that Paul is giving to us. Look at verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them take care of them. And do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Doesn't that make sense? If you have a mom or a dad, and they're a widow, you may want to palm them off on somebody else. But that's not the Christian thing to do. You may really wish that the church would just come in and take care of all of those things. But Paul's saying that's not really the church's job. It's our job. It's our job to take care of them. I'm sure, I am absolutely sure, mom got sick and tired of changing your dirty diapers. I'm sure that she got sick and tired of telling you to close the doors which you still don't close. I'm sure she got tired of a lot of this. I'm sure that getting up three or four times a night just to make sure you were still breathing got to be taxing. I'm sure that telling you to do your homework when the last thing in the world you wanted to do was homework was not pleasant for her. So we need to show that respect back to them. Okay, now he goes back to the church's treatment of its leaders or elders. Look at verse 17. He says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, 
especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now the picture here is that that mill that they had. I don't know if you've seen pictures of them, but there would be a, a big grinding wheel. And the ox would be in front of it pulling this this bar that would come out this way, right? And the oxen would be would be hooked to that bar. And there would be a grinding wheel over here, grinding against another uh, rock platform here. They would pour the grain in there, and the oxen would walk around. He would walk around in a circle, and as he did, he would grind the grain that everybody else would end up baking and making their meals out of. Some, most, would let the oxen eat of whatever fell on the ground. This is the illustration he's using. He's saying, don't muzzle the ox that's doing all the work for you. You're going to save a penny, but that's not what you need to do. You need to let the ox eat from that. So let me make another illustration. What he's saying here is that in regards to honor, and you can interpret honor in many different ways. But when it comes to honor, those who are serving well, they deserve double honor. Ann Ross comes to mind. She's been back there in that Sunday school department since she was 12. No, I'm just kidding. She hasn't been back there that long. But she's been back there forever, ever. She's faithful. She loves those kids. She puts together lessons for them every single week. She never comes in at the last minute unprepared because she loves those kids. She's been doing this for a long, long, long time. She has people call up at the last five minutes and say, oh, I can't be there. And she has to take a class or they have to double a class. She, she floats and she readjusts to all of those things. She is worthy of double honor. You see Ann Ross, you pick up a child, say thanks to her. Say thanks to all of those Sunday school teachers who could be in here with us, but they choose to be back there loving your kids or or watching your children. They are worthy of double honor. Anyone who decides, hey, I want to serve the Lord and and I I just love him, I want to do what I can, that, that person is worthy of double honor. David back at the board, worship team that does their thing, the guys that come in and make sure all the pockets are filled, you know, in the back of the seats so that if you guys need anything to ride on, you've got that. All that it takes to make everything happen. The guys that show up at, at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning every single Sunday and open the gates and blow off the, the sidewalk so that it looks good. Those, they're worthy of double honor. You know, you guys see me or Pastor Dan up here teaching. You see the worship team. There are probably three or four times that amount of people you don't see. You, you, don't, know the, you don't know who they are. You don't know their names. But they are worthy of double honor. So, he cites these two phrases out of Leviticus and Deuteronomy to remind Christians that they should financially take care of those who are spiritually taking care of them. Again, back to the storehouse. It's God's. And I really believe that it should be full because of our graciousness, because there's so many hurting people. Guys, look around. Just look around. There's, there's people that are hurting. There's people that, that need a hamburger, you know, legitimately. There's, there's folks who, who need things. And it would bless my heart, and I know it would Pastor Dan's, and I think everybody else who serves here, it would bless us so much to be in a position where we could help. Where we could do that. But we all have to have that vision. You know, we all have to have that vision. Okay, look at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Now, please understand, this is not set here to let elders off the hook. That's not what it's there for. He's already talked about respect and honor, right? He's already talked about double honor to those who serve and serve well. Now, you're, 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 we're supposing that that honor, that elder, that deacon... Uh, That leader is doing well, serving well, and we're not supposed to take an accusation against them unless there's two or three witnesses. Unless it's something that comes up, not just a personal beef, not just somebody who goes, I don't don't like the way they look, but there's really a legitimate problem. Now, two or three witnesses. 
I'd like to say this. Even if you get two or three witnesses, doesn't mean that he did anything wrong. Or that they did anything wrong. Could be. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. And here's what I base that on. Remember the crowd who yelled out to set Barnabas free? Remember if anybody cried out for Jesus? You can gather a big group to agree with you, but it doesn't mean that you're right. In this case, they were wrong. The crowd was yelling to set Barabbas free. Very few were yelling uh, yelling for Jesus. And if they were, they were yelling crucify. So just because we have a bunch of people we can get to agree with this doesn't necessarily mean that we're right. Again, I want to go back to Matthew 18. If you have something against a brother or sister, you go to them privately. That's what you take care of first. If that doesn't work, you get somebody else who's spiritual, somebody who's mature in the Lord, and you go talk to that individual. The last thing that you do is bring it to the church. You try to take care of it one-on-one. Oftentimes, that's the first thing we do. Look at Matthew 20, I mean, excuse me, 1 Timothy 5.20. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. He's saying don't let your preferences interfere with what really needs to be done. If you have kids, we don't want to spank them. Because you get thrown in jail now. We, I, I hated having to discipline my kids. I hated having to, to, to invest the time in the training of my kids. I just wanted to enjoy them. You know, you get this little guy or little girl and they're so stinking cute. And you just want them to stay cute all their life. And then they learn how to say no. <laughs> right? Then they learn how to say I hate you. And then they learn a lot of other things I can't repeat. (laughs) And all you want to do is you just want to love them. But what kind of parent would you be if you didn't teach them right from wrong? If you didn't give them some, some guidelines? Yes, you love them, but don't punish them. Don't punish them because you love them by not giving them proper training. You may think that you're giving them, you know, you're letting them off and you're really showing them love because you don't really give them much discipline. You're not. You're not helping them. You've got to set some guidelines and there has to be a certain amount of discipline in that child's life because correction is not a lack of love, but it is an act of love. We need to be corrected from time to time. So he's basically saying here, if you see somebody that's sinning, He says, rebuke them in the presence of all. That does not neglect Matthew 18 of going to them first. This is a last resort setting. It's a last resort situation when you have someone that you know is ready to fall. And they won't listen and you've gone to them and you've gone to them. He's talking about publicly, publicly telling them. Man, you got to get it together. Because if you continue the way you're going, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. And he says, do this without prejudice. You don't just do it to one you don't like. And the one you like, you don't do it. You don't do it to it. So the child that you don't like, he gets all the discipline. The one that you like, he doesn't get any discipline. What a horrible thing to do to our kids. We need to be equal in that. Not showing any partiality. I think he also tells Timothy that... Think long and hard before you lay hands on somebody to serve in the church. And you're going to see it in the next one. Look at 522. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily or suddenly, nor share in another, uh, other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Do not lay hands on anyone suddenly. That doesn't mean smacking them up against the head. Although you've probably been times you wanted to lay hands suddenly on someone. But he's saying this, he's talking about leadership, and he's saying, look, don't just, because somebody comes in and can carry a tune, don't just put them in the worship team, in the worship team because they can sing a tune. 
Don't just put somebody in a leadership spot just because they can provide this or they can provide that. Watch them a little while. See what they're made of. See what they are, who they are in the dark when no one's around. Make sure that you're, you're, you're putting the kind of person in that leadership spot that you know. If you want to call somebody up and say, hey, I want you to watch my three-year-old for about two or three hours. I'm going to be gone. Would you just go to Craigslist? <laughs> oh, yeah, here's a guy. Ah, the prison record doesn't matter. Right? That's okay. And, you know, convictions. That, that, no, that's, he's cheap. You know, he's cheap. He's cheaper than anybody here. I can overlook the other things. You don't, you don't do that, do you? If you're going to have somebody watch your child, which is one of the most prized possessions that you have, or prize, uh, I don't know if I'd call it possession, but you're, God, you're responsible for him, so I guess it, it kind of is. The most prized thing that you have in your life, you're going to be careful about what you do. Well, that's what he's telling Timothy, the church is God's. The church is God's, so those that you let rule over it, make sure they have the right heart. Make sure they have the right love and the right grace and the right mercy and the right motives. And the right motives. I'm convinced sometimes we do not even know what our own motives are. You can have a desire to be accepted because you weren't accepted maybe as a kid. You can have a desire to be accepted and throughout your whole life you find yourself doing things because you weren't loved as a kid. You don't realize that you don't, you don't even think that that's going on, but that's what you're, you're doing. You need the approval of other people. Now, is that necessarily all bad? No, not at all. Sometimes it motivates us to be better, to do awesome things in the Lord. But what I am saying is that if you're going to put somebody in a leadership spot in the church, you need to watch them for a while. You need to make sure that they're, they're, the, they're the real thing. Look at verse 22. Well, that's the one I just said. Keep yourself pure. I'm going to conclude with this. Look at 23, 24, and 25, and I'll be done here. No longer drink only water. He's talking to Timothy specifically. Timothy had stomach ailments. He says, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And some of you are going to go home and say, Pastor said I can drink all the wine I want. (laughs) That's not... Now, this is Paul talking to Timothy, young Timothy, who had problems with his stomach. He says in 24, he says, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So he says, uh, Timothy, you're, you're sick a lot, and uh, this is the only medication we have right now, so have a little bit of this, see if it, if it helps. But he goes on and say, says at the end of that, and this is the last part of this teaching, and that is, some sins can be hidden from people, but no sin is hidden from the Lord. Scripture says, be sure that your sin will find you out. We may sin in secret, but it often gets shouted from the rooftops. It's better off to, we're not perfect, we're going to miss the mark. There's going to be sin in our life. But let it be unintentional, not practiced.